I used to be angry about it. I used to resent the world, resent society, because all the people downtown in the nights, they'd walk on past with their buddies going to get drinks at the bar. How could you not know that we were children, right? When you've been forced to do things that make your skin crawl, how long does it take to heal, to kill the monsters in your past, and can you ever live a normal life again? She's had these questions for 12 years. She lives without electricity, without running water, and without her daughter. At 26 years old, she is the face of child exploitation and its damage. But we can't show you her face, and we can't tell you her name either. The two women you'll meet in this story first approached CBC News in November of 2016. They wanted their stories told and their faces on TV, but the law had other ideas. The women signed affidavits. They gave full consent. But after CBC lawyers spent months in court, a judge upheld a publication ban concealing their identities. A publication ban has never been overturned for a victim of child pornography, and these women will not be the first. And so, we'll call her Phoebe. I don't want to be the girl hiding behind the shadows of her past. I want to be the survivor who stands up and faces her past. It's the year 2003 and Phoebe is 12 years old, but she doesn't want anyone to know her age. She's about to sell her body to a grown man outside of the Supreme Court in St. John's, and she can never forget her first time. I was so nervous and I, I was almost to the point of overdosing on cocaine. I remember screaming as he pushed my face down into his back seat, begging for him to stop, begging for it to be over. It was the longest 20 minutes of my life. As a child, you cannot consent to any of what I went through. It wasn't my fault. I didn't ask for any of it. She was born in Conception Bay South, Raised in a happy family at first, but things change. Families fall apart, children rebel. Phoebe was taken from her home and placed in foster care at the age of 10. The abuse begins. There was one foster home. The wife would go to sleep and the husband would get up and molest us. You know, and you're afraid to tell your social worker, you're afraid to tell the police, your, your guidance counselor. Right? And the, that they won't believe you. Looking to escape the assault, Phoebe turns to the streets. But there she finds the terror only amplifies. Sources have told CBC involved in an investigation. and making child Girls pornography involved, ranged this from is 13 the sort of thing to 16. Young people should never be exposed to. Big Bite Pizza it was a scary place, and there was times that I was homeless and I had to do pictures just for food. Street kids and sex workers gravitate towards Big Bite Pizza on Water Street. Minaj Shablak, a Kuwaiti immigrant, had a lust for young girls, and he had a Sony digital camera. We'd sit down in the restaurant part until he waved us back, which was normally when customers left. And then we'd go in the back or down in the basement and even up in the food processing area where they'd have the prep table and everything like that. And uh, he'd grab out his camera and he'd tell you what way to pose. And he'd always say he'd do it from the neck down as not to have faces involved because he knew we were all children. But Shablak is not her most feared predator. That title belongs to Sean Newman, her 33-year-old pimp. A mentally unstable man with violent tendencies, her protector, but also her worst nightmare. He just gained my trust and 
you know, told me everything would be okay. He told me he'd be my friend and he loved me and cared for me and I, uh, I believed him. What was that process like? You know, where, where did this happen? Um, it happened downtown in front of the courthouse, actually. Um, that was the one spot he always put me, and he'd have customers lined up at first, and so I'd just go with them, do as they said, because that's what he told me to do, and then I had to bring the money back and put it in the console in his vehicle. And we'd go to a few hits of crack and he'd put me back out there. These tricks were often violent, grown men with dangerous desires. The one I remember is getting tied to a tree and beaten and then left there. And my friend found me. How old were you then? I was probably 12, 13. How does a 12 year old process that in their mind? You know, how do you, how do you reason with why this is happening to you? Drugs. You use drugs to help cover up your emotions and how you're feeling and help you forget. Chemical relief, one of many things Phoebe shared with her friend. Menad Shablak ran a pizza shop in St. John's, but it was so much more than that. He gave jobs to young girls living on the streets with troubled lives. But Menad Shablak was no saint. This is Sarah. During a period of homelessness at 15 years of age, she got a job at Big Bite Pizza. That's when she was approached by Shablak. He wanted her to pose naked in the store. Homeless and desperate, Sarah did it. It had a whole impact on the rest of my life. It's just something that I never got over. You never get over the humiliation or the guilt, the shame and you always feel like it's your fault. I ended up on drugs for years, for I think it was like eight years or something after that on heavy drugs and in and out of really abusive relationships. It really affected everything I did. It affected who I was. Menad Shablak could not keep it a secret. He pleaded guilty and served 11 months for photographing six underage girls. Both women say there was no follow-up after, no help offered to them after they helped put away their predator. They just kind of threw us to the curb. And I found that uh, really difficult, especially once I got older. There was no, no counseling, no programs offered. We were just left in whatever situation we were in in the beginning. What does that do for your your self-confidence? It, um, it makes you feel like nobody cares about you and that you're not worth anything. And for a long time, I felt like I was worthless. Things got worse when Sarah turned to needles. There were nine or 10 overdoses in a short period of time, waking up kicking, punching, and clawing at the people who were trying to save her life. Just knowing that I almost died and waking up and not knowing who I was or where I was or if I had someone with me not knowing who they were and not being able to speak, not knowing how to speak. It was an extremely scary situation and I guess with everything that had happened to me in the past, the first thing that I would think about was that I was being raped. The memories are all too much for Phoebe some days. She rarely leaves her house, which is hard when the winter comes. She moves her bed into the living room next to the wood stove. But there's a different kind of cold running through her frail bones. You just get tired of the nightmares and the flashbacks, and you just want it all to stop. And a lot of times I used to just cut
cut just to be able to feel pain and see my own blood to know I was, I was an actual person, you know? Not this ice cold skeleton that I feel like. Self-destruction is a theme Sarah is all too familiar with. But after hitting rock bottom and losing her son, Sarah got on track. She was accepted to Memorial University and began working towards a degree. But then, a few months into sobriety, she broke. It was a 14-hour relapse, and I ended up in the hospital after having a heart attack. A cocaine-induced heart attack. She nearly lost everything and knew it had to be her last relapse. And it was. Today, Sarah is one semester away from her degree. She lives a full life with her partner, and she got her son back. I'm so scared that um, he's going to end up going down the same road that I did. You know, all I can do is do my best to prevent that from happening and be the best mother I can be so that he, way he doesn't have a need to go out and use drugs. Phoebe knows how hard it is to be a mom with the memories of exploitation. Her daughter isn't here. The little girl stays with her grandmother. She's, she's my rock. She's a wonderful little girl who don't, she don't know about her mommy's past, but she know mommy's not around a lot. And I believe that if someone would have seen the warning signs, the police, the social workers, anybody, I believe that my, my daughter would have the best mom she deserves, as we're now she don't. Phoebe has been sober since the Newman trial in 2007. Instead of going to prison, Sean Newman was found dead on the day his appeal was denied. Phoebe remembers feeling relief. Sean Newman could not control her anymore. Today, she's trying to heal. She's trying to kill those monsters in her past. And most importantly, she's trying not to hurt herself anymore. In her frail bones, there's a feeling fighting against the cold, a feeling that she has work to do. I, I've had many attempts and for some reason I'm still here and I believe it's to get my story out and even if I can just change one girl's life that means the most to me it means that what I went through wasn't for nothing.